a love triangle. Chapter 1. I walked around it, marveling that after 80 years it was still standing, and even seemed sturdy. I tried the padlock, then smashed the rusty latch with a hammer. It was dark inside, but it had to be, because in those days we used to close the windows carefully. The dissimilar couches were still in place, as was the carpet that covered the walls. The bandstand was still there too, and so were the words Earl had painted behind it. The shack. It had once been a village store, built in the thirties and abandoned when supermarkets and chain stores came along. Earl's family owned it, and he got permission to use it as a gym. We all contributed money together and had electricity installed. We scraped together what we could. I had an uncle who owned a furniture store who also sold and installed rugs, and he gave us scraps, old rugs he had taken down at work, whatever we could find. We used the rugs to deaden the sound. We got pretty loud at times. I moved the flashlight around. Every corner evoked memories for me. I was so sick of cheap wine that I threw it up in this corner and had to clean it up the next morning with a hangover. I threw up over and over again. And in that corner, on that old love seat, I was with Wanda Jenkins on a cold November night when I was two weeks away from my 18th birthday. I had just joined the group, the youngest member. Everyone else was already 18, except Earl, who was 21. I became friends with everyone except Gordy the drummer, but he didn't like anyone at the time. Later, it turned out he was crazy, and he really resented the fact that we were with all the girls who hung out with us, and he couldn't openly do the same. I think we all knew, but he was such an asshole that we never got around to telling him we didn't care. That's right. We were a band, rock and roll at its most basic. We were pretty raw back then. It took a year to get us together enough to play in front of an audience. Earl played bass. Gordy was a damn good drummer despite his attitude. Will was a decent lead guitarist. And I, James Grunt Thomas, played keyboards and guitar, even a little saxophone and occasional harmonica. This gave us a little more depth than most bands of the time. Gordy and Earl sang and Will and I did backing vocals. Every once in a while we'd invite the Pointless Sisters, which consisted of a few girls who hung around just for fun. We were all young, just discovering life. We were in a unique position. We had a place where we could do whatever we wanted, and since Earl was 21, we could get all the booze we could afford. I was a dealer, hooked on it, thanks to my biker brother. If I thought we were going too far, I'd stop getting them, saying my brother needed to lay off for a while. Then he got caught and went to jail, and the lie became the truth. The building was huge, and the back was designed for living quarters, which was quite common at the time. We built a small stage out of materials I had gotten from my construction job. We also went to my uncle for used couches, and he gave us the best ones he had. The ones he agreed to recycle as part of his delivery service, so we had plenty of comfortable seating. A couple of them even reclined. We usually stayed there overnight on weekends. We weren't complete idiots, and when we practiced, we practiced. Oh, we might have a beer or two, but... Usually it was weeknights, and we all had work to do. The parties were on weekends, unless we had a gig. We'd play a song or two, and then we'd have a blast. Jerry was our new guy. He ran the sound equipment and lighting. He usually had a cute, red-headed girl with him on the weekends, but never during the week. Earl and I were the two serious musicians in the band. Sometimes we would show up and be the only ones there. We spent time honing our sound. Besides bass, Earl was a pretty good guitar player. I played parts and he played rhythm. Sometimes we'd play acoustics, and sometimes we'd crank up the amps and try to tear down the walls. That's what we were doing one night when little redhead Bonnie showed up with her sister looking for Jerry. They sat down on one of the couches, listening, smiling, clapping their hands. Her sister Julie's name was Jules. She played in a girl band and surprised us all by sitting behind the drums. We played Zeppelin, Cream, Mountain, everybody you could think of. Earl liked the music of the last generation better than what was coming out then. He did a Mississippi Queen howl, one of the best we'd ever heard. We had fun until Gordy came in, two hours late. He erupted into a shouting match about this fool making out with his kit, even though she hadn't touched anything. When he tried to slap her, I yanked my hand away. Try that on me, motherfucker. At least she was here and we had a drummer to rehearse with. He was high. Fuck you. You want her. Keep her. I'm out of here. He jumped out, throwing shit around haphazardly. 
I followed him to the door to make sure he didn't rip anything serious and waited for him to drive out of the gravel parking lot. I turned around and smirked at her. So, Jules, do you want to retire? That's the way it is. Having a girl drummer who could sing helped increase the number of our fans. Soon we were playing every weekend. Jerry hired Bonnie to handle the sound, so she was always around. I was starting to get tired of playing on weekends so someone else could have fun, so we conferred and decided to take two weekends off and just hang out. We had all already lost our girlfriends because they wanted to go out and have fun like everyone else. Jules was having a hard time with her breakup, and we reached out to each other. Nowadays it's called Friends with Benefits, but back then, it didn't have a name. We went to the local lake a few times, and I can tell you that both Jules and Bonnie know how to wear a bikini. We were in the water, playing, having a hell of a good time, when Jerry decided to be jealous of Bonnie. I had her on my shoulders, and Jean, another friend who happened to be there, was holding Jules, and we were wrestling. Jules got a little carried away and accidentally pulled Bonnie's top down. Everyone got it except me, because I was under her. She shrieked and crawled backwards, pulling me with her. I thought I was going to drown. I surfaced next to her, and she was standing up to her neck in the water, fiddling with her top and laughing. Seemingly out of nowhere, Jerry appeared next to us and started cursing at her. He was really drunk. You're stupid! God damn it! Giving the whole beach a freebie! I should spank the hell out of you. Are you so proud of that? Then over here. Before she could move, he grabbed her, yanked off her top, and headed for the shore, laughing like hell. I think I'll round up my buddies and have them wait here until you get out. I didn't think. I just grabbed him from behind, gripped him tightly in his long hair, and shoved him under me. Jules and Bonnie were screaming, as well as a few other girls who were there. I didn't pay attention to them until he let go of her top and it floated to the surface. I grabbed it, tossed it to Jules, picked his head up and pushed him off. He was floundering on the shore, and everyone was looking at me. I was young, fit, with muscles that could only come from hard work on a construction site, and I was furious. No one said a word while I checked on the girls. Jules drove Bonnie home. Party atmosphere? Gone. I walked past Jerry and his friends. And though they threw dirty looks at me, no one said anything. Jules came into the store after calming Bonnie down and thanked me for protecting her little sister. Three times. Eventually, we piled onto the cot. Earl had a girl we nicknamed Cherry. The nickname was actually Cherry Picker, but we shortened it. She was the oldest in our group, she was 24, and she had tattoos in the late 70s when they weren't in vogue yet. She ran with a biker gang for a few years until they told her she was too old and worn out and kicked her to the curb. I have no idea how she ended up at Earl's. We gave her that nickname because we were still socializing with young men, and if she thought there was the slightest chance a guy didn't have a girlfriend, she would run after him so fast he had no idea what hit him. It was almost like a civic duty for her. Guys were quick to understand her, act reserved with her, and she spent nights with them. Earl knew this and laughed they had a strange relationship. He'd occasionally hook up with some chick he'd met at a concert, and she'd just pick some half-drunk guy and have fun on her own. In fact, it was Cherry who came up with the plan. She told Earl about it, and they tried it out in private. He let us get half-stoned before he talked about it. Do you know what the Mazzola holiday is? Of course, we had no idea, and he brought us up to speed. Well, you get a bunch of girls and guys together, put down some kind of bedding, cover it with plastic, then you pour out two or three bottles of Mazzola and start sliding and sliding. If the one you slide over is ready, you're having a good time until you slide over to the other one. Wow. He was talking about the very same thing. We didn't have the internet back then, but we had dirty magazines and paperbacks and a few movies we managed to get our hands on. So we knew exactly what we were talking about. We were high at the time, so we didn't really get into it, but the seed was laid. One night I talked to Jules after we had checked out a nice night. One of her casual partners had introduced her to something interesting, and she was eager to share her knowledge. She showed me what girls like. By the third time she was pulling my long hair, so I thought I had it all worked out. She lay on her back, panting. Damn, lover, if you've practiced on the other one, point her out to me. I need to kiss her. That was amazing. Okay, 
With the other one, I did the same thing I did with the game. I stuck to the basic structure, but improvised when I had the chance. We lay like that until she was recharged, me stroking her lightly until she reciprocated. Once we were satiated, we lay back down. So, have you thought about what Earl said? Of course I do. The thought of being with random women and playing with them excited me beyond belief. Hey, I was 18, a raging mass of hormones. I hadn't been in a serious relationship with anyone except Jules. And we still spent nights with other people when the opportunity arose. Yes, isn't it? Yes, I discussed it with Annette, Will's current girlfriend, and she likes the idea. We don't even need to ask Cherry, her plan. Jerry will probably be in on it if he can find a girl and you let him. He's still mad because you replaced him. As for that, Rhonda and Vicky will probably join us if you ask them to. Rhonda and Vicky were just a couple of girls who hung out with us. That's what we did. I asked my uncle to give me all the old carpet padding he had in stock, and I got some very strong plastic from a construction site. Already very slippery, I wondered if either of us would be able to hold on when we put oil on it. The finished product was 12 inches high, 20 feet square, and Earl and I attached small gutters on the sides to keep the oil from spreading everywhere. The night this was to take place, the girls came with a change of clothes, having thought ahead. At work, I got a huge shower that had been thrown away because of a crack in the side. I patched it up, hooked it up to the plumbing and toilet in the back room, and we found an old water heater that still worked. It came in handy when we crashed on Sunday and had to go to work on Monday. I kept the towels in a locked drawer because I liked nice towels and everyone usually used them, leaving me with the old and fleecy ones they brought with them. Apparently, I was the only one who knew how to work the washing machine, so I washed mine and left them lying around until they were almost able to stand on their feet. They just threw them away and bought new ones. We stood awkwardly until I pulled out a bag of goodies and afterward cards and we played stupid games whose goal was to get you drunk as quickly as possible. Soon, we were a bunch of giggling lumps of lust. I knew Jules well, so I tried to watch the others. Vicky was a little stocky. Rhonda seemed like her natural opposite. Tall, slender, but still looked pleasing to the eye. Annette, Will's girlfriend, was half black, which was unusual for the time when she had a white boyfriend. She had dark, creamy skin. Cherry, of course, was beside herself, almost drooling. Booger, I don't know how he got that nickname our new sound guy, was alone. But since there were more girls than guys, it wasn't a problem. Jerry showed up at the last minute, also alone. We almost didn't let him in. He's high most of the time now, even ran afoul of the law. Balancing sound takes concentration, and if you're fucked up, it doesn't happen. He made us sound really bad twice before we fired him. Besides, we had a good job. If the cops got curious about what this junkie and his friends were doing in the middle of nowhere like this, they'd start paying attention, and we didn't want our little arena shut down. The ratio of girls to boys ticked us off, so we opened the door. Earl and Cherry started by sprinting to the other side, laughing hysterically. As soon as they were up, I grabbed Jules and we tried it. After that, we all had to do it. Vicky squealed as someone else grabbed her. Then someone else slammed into us, knocking us off the plastic. We would jump up and dive back in, grabbing other partners. I seriously believe I was around every girl at one time or another. We stopped only to grab a fresh beer every now and then, and sipped it while watching the action. Cherry was in heaven. Things were starting to quiet down. While we were busy, Bonnie came in and undressed. She pressed herself against me, whispering in my ear, I don't want to do this. I thought I wanted to, but now I don't. Will was trying to get a grip on her, and so was Booger. If it hadn't been for Earl, things might have ended horribly. What the fuck, man? You're suddenly this? You want me to call Gordy? Earl jumped to his feet in a rage, but immediately fell back down. Finally, they pulled him to the edge. Earl and Booger took him by the arms and literally threw him out the front door. He rolled across the gravel parking lot, covered in dust and gravel from the oil. They threw his clothes out after him and locked the door. By the time most of us left, he was gone. That gave me a chance to take Bonnie into the back room. She was shaking. I thought I could do it. I really thought I could. But it was too much. I wouldn't have even hit the floor if someone hadn't pushed me. She trembled, and I pulled her to me. Finally, she calmed down. Then she giggled, looking down. How are we even going to get rid of this mess? I pulled back the curtain and showed her the shower. 
even opening my drawer to pull out a couple nice towels. I told her I'd stand guard, and she looked at me like I was crazy before dragging me inside. I need you to wash my back. I was pretty good at it. She said something to him, but that moment, like many I voiced and posted on Patreon, I lasted quite a while. She whimpered a little at first, but by the end she was demanding that I rub her back harder. The water was still flowing, and I looked down and saw there... She was the one. The thought made me pass out and it was complete. You should have told me, I said when she wrinkled her nose. Why? I wanted this. How did you feel? I have no basis for comparison. You're the first one I've ever been with. I'll tell you this, you were very enthusiastic and it was great. I'm hoping to find out if it was beginner's enthusiasm or just the start of great things to come. She giggled when I sat down next to her and pulled on one of the shirts I kept in my box. It barely covered her. Why me? I asked, snuggling up to her. Would you believe you just happened to be around? She giggled at my expression. No, honey, I wanted you to be in that spot. You're a good guy. You treat all the girls with respect. Oh, you play the game, but you don't try to pressure anyone. You're the talk of the town, baby. Besides, she said, I was in love with you from the first time I saw you. I used to get so upset when Jules would come home after being with you, giggling, hair must, walking a little cautiously. I knew you wouldn't hurt me. We hugged for about twenty minutes before we checked on the others. I'd always assumed that the look of someone who looked like a straggler was just a facial expression, until I saw the whole oil-soaked pile in front of me. They were all perfectly fine except for Will. Jules was lying on the edge, almost comatose. We shook her a little and Bonnie helped her to the shower. They both got dressed and we left. The whole thing sure worked up an appetite. Three huge burger barn specials and a ton of fries later, we were finally full. By the time we got back, everyone was either gone or sprawled out on the couch. I took the girls to the back room and showed them the cot I preferred, along with the sheets. I fell asleep. We came out a few minutes later. The next morning we woke up alone. It took some work, but I managed to get us all into the shower. There was a lot of hitting, sighing and squealing before we were clean. Jules didn't let me get dressed. Not yet. Bonnie told me you got her cherry on the cake last night. Now you have something else to show her. I showed myself, and while she lay there and recovered, Jules made me do her. As a reward, Jules taught Bonnie how to give head. It was a long agonizing session because Jules wouldn't let me finish the job until Bonnie did it right. What can you say about this kind of experience? Nothing. We showered again, separately, and went back to our normal lives. Earl brought it up a couple more times, but by then I was already involved with Bonnie and didn't want to share, and Jules had found what she thought was true love. Annette got pregnant, and Will turned into an asshole by not supporting her. The band didn't so much break up as dissipate. I married Bonnie, Jules lived with her boyfriend for a year until he slapped her, and she moved in with us for six months before finding true love again. Cherry was estranged from Earl, and he was glad to see her go. Fast forward five years. I was still working on a construction site and was an assistant foreman. The economy was booming and things were going very well for me. Bonnie and I had been married for three years. She worked part-time and we took all my overtime money to pay for her tuition in the nursing program at the community college. When she graduated from college with honors, she got a weekend job as an ER nurse and continued to study until she became a registered nurse worked in the operating room, and brought in as much or more than I did. It was my turn, and I entered the construction management field. We also managed to produce a daughter, Joy Marie. As soon as I got my degree, we had Jason Paul. We looked for and bought a house in the country, and I added to it as often as I could, and when Bonnie got pregnant again, giving birth to Jane in July, we sold it for more than twice what we paid for it. That got us into the business of reselling houses, not like you see on these shows now, but conservatively, bought distressed properties, remodeled and sold. I got a lot of labor from the bands I worked with at my regular job, moonlighted on weekends, and once the kids were big enough, they learned how to push brooms and take out the trash. When I was 35, Bonnie and I reviewed our finances, I quit my job, and we went full steam ahead. I bought an undervalued property on the outskirts of town and built 240 storage units. I now have six different locations, almost a thousand storage units, with an 80% occupancy rate. I still kept in touch with Earl when he was in town. 
In fact, we remained a close-knit group throughout our lives. Four years after the group broke up, we all went on vacation together. Earl, his new girlfriend, Bonnie and me, Jules, and her current lover. We were in Daytona Beach a few months after the rally, and it was pretty quiet. We had tickets to see Out Cold, a very good band in their day, but now on the rise. They've gone from being headliners in huge arenas to doing smaller venues. They canceled the concert because of personnel problems. Apparently, their bass player got high, trashed a motel room, beat up one of the cops who came to arrest him, threw a girl out of a car, and took off. It was a Friday night, and traffic on Main Street was heavy. They literally walked down the sidewalk, yanked him out of the car, and arrested him. He was charged with so many things, and bail was so high that the band refused to post it. As a result, they held open auditions the next morning, trying to find someone to fill a spot on the night's show. Dude, you should try it. If nothing else, it'll make a good story. What have you got to lose? We had to almost drag him to the audition. Four people tried out in front of Earl, but only one was worthwhile, and that one was kind of mechanical. They handed Earl an old Fender Precision, plugged it in and started playing. It was a song we used to play back home. Earl didn't miss a note. We played the next two songs and he did even better. Then they ran two songs he wasn't familiar with and he missed a couple notes. Five more guys were waiting to try out, but the auditions were closed. Out Cold had a new bass player. They offered him a contract for 12 gigs to see if he was a good fit and could handle the road life. Three gigs a week would bring him more money than three months at a regular job at home. After they were done with business, they asked him if he knew of a guitarist who could help them that night. Their rhythm guitarist had gotten over food poisoning, and they needed someone to play three or four songs to give him a rest. Earl told them, I know four of their songs. That night, I finally got to see what it was like to play in front of a large audience. I was scared to death. I rehearsed with them during the day, and they crammed all four songs into a mid-set. I was playing, and the regular guitarist was puking in a bucket. Apparently, that was all he needed to recuperate and finish the night. I have many photos taken during my only claim to rock warrior status. Earl continued to play with them for another 10 years. He joined the band at just the right time. They had a new guitarist five months earlier, and he and Earl worked together as the new guys in the band. They settled in the same room and soon began writing music. Four of their songs made it to the next album. This restarted their career, and they started performing in stadiums again. Over the next 10 years, they recorded four more albums, and at the end, they released a best of compilation, Volumes 1 and 2. The first contained recordings before Earl and Jason, and the second was mostly of themselves. Booger became a financial planner, and Earl invested a lot of money in him. When the group broke up, his investment was a million seven, not counting other assets like the 4,000 square foot house I built for him, and the piece of land he bought from his family. Earl got married once, and it lasted about a year. She tried to make it ugly, but all the stuff he made her sign did the trick. She complained that she didn't really understand what she was signing, and the lawyers didn't sympathize with her. The children were grown, all self-sufficient, and the older two had started families. Bonnie didn't think she would enjoy being a grandmother, but once she got a glimpse of her first child, she immediately jumped at the chance. We left them at our house a lot. I think she would have moved in with them if she could have done that. She stopped working when our business could support us, helping me in any way she could, coordinating crews, making sure we had the right permits, until she knew almost as much about construction as I did. When JJ went to college, Bonnie came to me with a plan. She wanted to go back to work as a nurse. She got all the necessary certifications and worked as an emergency room nurse for about a month. I came home one day and found her crying on the couch. Our town was small and fairly quiet, but a few gangs from the big city had moved into our neighborhood. They ran into each other, and things went downhill quickly. The emergency room was full. They tried to save them, but three died before reaching the hospital, and a 14-year-old literally died in her arms. Bonnie finished her week and never came back. The local police didn't exactly sympathize with the gangs, making it clear that they should stay out of their jurisdiction. One gang tried to fight back, and two went missing, never to be heard from again. The local police seemed to be like all small-town Southerners. They could fight among themselves like cats and dogs, but if outsiders tried to do something about it, they stood united. The national leader was something of a computer genius, and his best model showed a takeover probability of less than 
and a chance that he could lose up to 40 members to jail or worse. He did what many CEOs would do. He left us alone and walked on by, entrenching himself in a neighboring town. About a year before Out Cold released their last album, the band took a three-month break to rest, recuperate, and write new material. Earl brought his writing partner home, introduced him to us, and soon he was one of us. We even jammed one night. This caught Earl's attention, and soon he had a gig booked for two nights at the biggest cafe concert hall in town. He called me to tell me about it. Bored, I take it? Who's going to play with you? He looked surprised. You and Jules, who else do I need? Julie hadn't played in years, but we bought her a set and practiced every night for ten days. We had people sitting with us just jamming, trying to remember our parts. Earl added a couple more amps and another keyboard station in case they wanted to show up. The hall was so full that people weren't allowed in. It seemed like everyone wanted to see a hometown guy who was successful. We played a few out cold songs that he and Jason had written, and then moved on to some old rock and blues. Jules sang a few songs, including Tell Mama, an old Etta James song that had the room shaking. The next night, it was almost a high school reunion. In typical Earl style, he and Jason donated all proceeds to local charities, further cementing his status as a local legend. They toured again, energized, and their next album went platinum, thanks mostly to three songs Earl and Jason wrote while they were with us. Earl told me that he and Jason were tired of the road, and were thinking of calling it quits after the next tour. The decision became moot when the lead singer, drummer, and lead guitarist were killed in a car accident. It wasn't their fault, and an autopsy showed they had no drugs or alcohol in their system. They were returning from breakfast when they were hit. However, the guy who ran the red light had pot in his blood and a blood alcohol content almost twice the legal limit. He was charged with three counts of vehicular homicide and asked to plead guilty but he still did quite a bit of time before he was released. Earl returned home and brought Jason with him. They lived together and released one album, simply titled Jason and Earl, which sold about 250,000 copies. Jason came to me wanting to buy a house. Unlike Earl, he wanted a small cottage with a large yard. I built him a 1,500-square-foot house with many outdoor additions, such as an 800-square-foot patio with an eight-person hot tub. There was a covered walkway leading to the pool and outdoor kitchen, and the yard was landscaped to perfection. He was very happy, and we ended up spending a lot of time with him. Annette moved back to town, and we dragged her along with us. It wasn't love at first sight, but the interest was pretty obvious, and no one was surprised when she moved in with us eight months later. When Earl passed away, it came as a surprise to him. He didn't drink much, he liked to run, and he was near his ideal weight, but when his heart stopped working, none of that mattered. We found him in the music room, surrounded by memorabilia, gold records, tour posters, an old tattered Fender precision bass in a lighted cabinet. He was just writing a new song and turned on the recorder. We heard his last breath and his last words in this life. What the fuck? There was a lot about him in the papers and the funeral was packed. Sure, he was a minor celebrity, but most came because they genuinely liked him, just a good boy like the rest of us who happened to be good. To my surprise, I was appointed executor of his estate, and he had a pretty detailed will. He left Jason all the things left behind from their life together. He left a few of his friends small memories. He left me his old base and love shack along with the nine acres of land it stood on. He left me a letter. Grumble. Oh shit, so I'm dead, huh? I thought I was gonna outlive all of you. We had some good times, didn't we, brother? Best part of my life was when we played in that old building. I bought it from my family when they wanted to sell it to a developer. I wanted you to have it if something happened to me, because you'd appreciate it more than anyone else. Maybe you could throw a party in Earl Mazzola's honor. It would bring back memories, wouldn't it? I hope to see you again someday. Maybe we can jam with Hendrix or B.B. King, tell Julie and Bonnie that I asked to keep an eye on you, and that I love them like the sisters I never had although I have had carnal thoughts about them. Later, brother, Earl. I was reading the letter in my office, and Jules and Bonnie were with me. I am not ashamed to say that tears flowed down all of us. Most of his estate, nearly $3 million in real estate and investments, went to the county to be used for the sole purpose of expanding children's activities and renovating two parks. Typical Earl.
At the entrance to the park, which was renamed in his honor, stands a life-size bronze figure of him holding his base. I came home after looking at the cabin and told Bonnie that it wasn't in bad shape, but I wasn't sure what I wanted to do with it. Bonnie and Jules said they would take a look at it and maybe we could make a decision. Projects started piling up. We had survived the tough years, even buying some distressed properties here and there. And now the economy was booming and people needed homes. I built four new houses, remodeled eight more, and bought more when the opportunity presented itself. Jules seemed to always be at my house, and the girls seemed to be in good spirits and laughing at things I didn't understand. On Wednesday, they demanded that I not work on Saturday, no matter how far behind we were. We had been working six days a week for 14 weeks, and we all needed a break. I ended up letting the entire team go Friday and Saturday, paying them for Friday to get a full check. I immediately became the best boss in the world, at least until Monday. July was living with us again. Her last relationship collapsed. She still looked good. She had a good figure and a pretty face, even if it had a few wrinkles. She was a loving, kind woman who just seemed to fall for the wrong guys. We joked that I should make her my second wife. She moved into the spare bedroom and made herself comfortable. Julie didn't have the drive that Bonnie had and just bounced from job to job until Bonnie scolded her and put her in charge of the property. She surprised us all by doing a great job. A few months later, she came to us with an offer to take over a failed project. Eleven new homes, all but two of which had been completed. Only three houses had been sold, and all of them were in foreclosure. The bank picked up the developer and was very eager to unload it. We got it for about 40% of what it would have been worth when the market recovered. We put July in charge, and the first thing she did was to get her real estate license, working under the umbrella of our company. Within six months, she sold five houses, recouping all of our investment. After that, we started giving her 25% of the profits after realtor fees. One day, it dawned on me that Julie had lived with us for over a year, even though she had the means to move out. One day, I asked her about it, and she wept, thinking I was kicking her out. I feel safe here, Jimmy. I love you guys and the stability you have. I think maybe I'm trying to sort myself out so I can be ready for the next time I fall in love with someone. I assured her she was always welcome, and she relaxed, and the next time we opened the hot tub, she joined us, and both girls giggled at my expression. Calm down, Jimmy. There isn't a square inch of this body that you don't know in detail. Bonnie said it's okay if you're only looking. I looked at my wife, noticing for the first time that she had lost her suit, and was the same as she had been in July. They both smirked, waiting for my reaction. I just stood up, took off my pants, and up, and soon they were both under my arms, and all the years seemed to melt away. To be clear, nothing happened, although body parts touched, with the usual results. They looked, but didn't touch. When they came out and positioned themselves on their sides, I noticed that both girls had their hair cut, but not completely, only in identical stripes, Bonnie a flaming redhead, and Jules a soft brunette. My compliments to your hairdresser, I told them, and laughed when they both blushed. Jules recovered first. I'm glad you approve. If you're interested, I'm sure we could arrange a little trimming. It was my turn to blaze red. They pulled out the wine and slid it back in. We drank two bottles, and then we were already wrinkled like prunes. Jules hugged me with her whole body. I jumped up and down and she giggled, but then let go and turned to Bonnie. There you go, sis. All set to go. I expect a good report in the morning. Before you go, do we have batteries? I think I'm going to need them. She took the towel and wrapped it around her waist. My gaze followed her all the way home. Hey, eyes on the spot. Let's go see if we can't do something to take the edge off. What do you say? I lifted her into my arms, surprising her. I plopped her down on the table. Bonnie let out a light shriek. Feeling eyes on me, I looked up and saw Jules standing in the patio doorway. When Bonnie recovered enough for me to help her up from the table, Jules was gone. Something was wrong. I could feel it. You can't live with someone for decades and not pick up their vibe. Both my girls walked around and smiled secretly, making incomprehensible hints about something I knew nothing about. This sort of thing in the hot tub was almost standard by now and Jules was getting bolder and bolder, and Bonnie seemed to be encouraging her. We'd had a little too much wine, and I was a little stoned and slow-witted. 
Jules sat on the edge of the hot tub across from me and started doing something. I remembered that she was pretty vocal. It got interesting when she started humming. Gimme, gimme, gimme! She exploded and slid bonelessly into the tub. Bonnie had been stroking me the whole time. Bonnie was panting softly, letting me know she was getting close. Jules giggled and sank down beside me. Bonnie stood up, looked at us and grinned, then slid into the tub and reached out for Jules's hand, her eyes widening before she added her own hand. Finally, I pushed them both away, climbing out of the tub. They just watched and giggled, waiting. Okay, spit it out. What's going on here? I know you're sending some kind of message, so take pity on the slumbering man and spill it out. They looked at each other, and the smiles slid off their faces. Bonnie started, but Jules stopped her. Grumpy, honey, come back. Make yourself comfortable, and we'll tell you our thoughts. Just promise us you'll listen. Finally, I lowered myself into the tub, and they pressed themselves against me, holding their hands above the water. Honey, how many years has Jules lived with us? Don't answer that. It's been many times. This time, it's almost two years. She paused, looking at Jules before continuing. The reason she hasn't moved out is because she's home. She loves us, and we love her. But honey, she's a mature woman. She has needs. All the men she's had in the past just didn't reach that level, and you were the yardstick she used. We've been talking about this for a long time. We have come to the following decision. First, she stays here, and second, she will be your second wife, with all the benefits and responsibilities of a wife. I can share you because I know you will never betray me, and we will be together for the rest of our lives. Jules has always loved you, and you have always loved her. It's a win-win for everyone. Wow, I didn't expect that to happen. I just stared at them until they lowered their eyes, fidgeting nervously. So, you've thought of everything, but you missed a few points. First of all, Bonnie, I've had a few moments of Jimmy Carter lusting after my heart, especially Jules but I've never even considered backing away from our vows. Besides, with all the added benefits come added responsibilities. Now I'll have two women to berate me, point out my flaws, run my life without my input, just like you are now. I know you've decided that two hot women will be a distraction for the rest of my life, but I'm at the age where not all the blood drains away from my brain. I'll think about it, but if, and that's a big if I do, Jules, I'll consider you as much of a wife as Bonnie. And Bonnie, you'll have to accept that you no longer have my undivided love and attention. There will be someone else, forever. I think I'll go for a drive now to clear my head. I left them in the bathroom, went into the house, put on shorts, sneakers and a t-shirt, jumped in the car, and just drove. I was gone for three hours and they called at least ten times, all of which I ignored. When I got back, they were a pretty low-key couple. Living room now! I didn't even look to see if they were following me. They were sitting on the couch, patting themselves on the spot in the middle. I sat down in the chair across from them. What led to this? Jules looked sad and sighed. Do you have any idea how many losers there are in our age group? A great many. Most of them have been through at least one rough divorce. Some have kids who decide to make your life hell because you took daddy away. Some are just perverts. And if there are any good ones, they're quickly snatched up. I'm tired of dating guys who are interested in how wealthy I am and how perverted I can be. Men are in short supply compared to women, and I can't help but believe that polygamy will be the next breakthrough. Don't believe me? Did you ever think you'd live to see a time when men would marry men and women would marry women without too many people taking offense to it? She was right. That's all well and good, but it's still uncharted territory. If I say yes, will we tell our kids? Our friends? Bonnie. Does this mean that somewhere in the future, you'll be considering a second husband? Jules looked shocked, and Bonnie blushed and lowered her eyes. I suddenly had a bad feeling that this polygamy thing might spread. No. Not only no, but hell no. I decided to attack from the flank rather than engage in a direct confrontation. If she's considering others, especially if she's already chosen one, our marriage is over. Do you see that this might lead to my opening anything? If I'm free to do it with both of you, shouldn't you have the same privileges? If that's the direction the bus is going, I'm afraid I'll have to get off. They both started to speak, and I held up my hand. Not a word. Not now. I'm afraid if we start, this will escalate into life-changing decisions. 
You have my word that we'll come back to this later, but for now, leave it at that. I headed for the workshop. Something about handling power tools that could cripple you if you weren't careful was good for me right now. It would make me focus and not think about what had happened. I had some black walnut that I had harvested five years ago, and it was seasoned enough to work with. Our daughter was about to have her firstborn, a baby girl. She was due in two months, and I was going to make an old-fashioned cradle for her. The black walnut was complemented with cherry and sharpie, and the red and white stripe really embellished the piece. I even made one hollow part of the cradle very long, as in the original. The women would sit in the rockers and sew or do other chores with their foot on the long, rocking wheel of the cradle. Each time the rocking wheel moved forward, the woman's foot would press on the cradle, causing it to rock to the beat. Joy was very excited and angry with me for not letting her see it until after she had the baby. I was smiling as I worked. Joy was very excited about the baby, and her husband, a good man, was over the moon. He was an only child, and his only requirement in their marriage was that they have at least three children. Joy grinned when he told her that. Really? You're going to shy away from three? I thought I was marrying a real man. They've already picked out names for the four. Finally I stopped, admiring the cradle that sat in the clamps, waiting for the glue to dry. I was putting things in order when I glanced at the clock on the wall. It was already ten o'clock. Why hadn't the girls called me? And then I remembered why I had come to the workshop in the first place. As I approached the house, I thought about what my life would be like a year from now. The girls were being very quiet. Bonnie timidly told me that my dinner was in the microwave. I heated up the leftovers and ate, rinsing the dishes and loading the dishwasher when I was done. Back in the living room, I turned my attention to the suddenly hushed conversation. I surprised Bonnie by pulling her to me and kissing her, then did the same to Jules. I love you girls no matter what. Now I'm going to shower and go to bed. Good night. I took a shower, half expecting the door to open any minute. But the door didn't open, and to my surprise, no one joined me in bed. I thought I was going to toss and turn, but after a few minutes, I fell asleep. I woke up when Bonnie appeared in bed, but snuggled up against me and dozed off again. The rest of the weekend passed in suspense. Monday morning came, and we were off. Bonnie and I to the construction office and Jules to the real estate firm. A few weeks passed, and I had pretty much put that discussion behind me. Jules and Bonnie had stepped up the flirting, and breakfast together had become quite common. We still cuddled in the hot tub, but there was no repeat of what had happened before. Then came the day my world changed again. The girls threw a dinner party, grilling steaks with all the condiments and homemade ice cream for dessert. They waited until we cleaned up to wow me with their idea. Jules and I went to the shack today. It brought back a lot of memories. It's a shame to let this lovely old building go to waste, and we've been thinking about redecorating and updating it a bit. We thought we could turn it into a small private club and rent it out for events. We could put a few acres of land around it for outdoor events, put picnic tables and a small bandstand. It could be used for outdoor weddings if we renovate everything properly. The interior is quite large, so we could open up some walls, update the plumbing, and have separate bathrooms. We could rent it out for retreats, private meetings, and even put a small bar in there. What do you think? I think you've thought this through carefully. I assume you have hard numbers and plans for the necessary permits. Who will be handling this? Jules pronounced. We've done most of the preliminary work, including the necessary zoning. It shouldn't be difficult. There's mostly farmland around anyway. I'm sure the commissioners will be happy to add to the tax base. I have yet to find out what kind of insurance is required for this kind of activity, and I'm willing to bet it will be pretty high, but we want to get as much coverage as possible. Bonnie jumped up. The work will be done by our crews. I don't like the idea of using outsiders, and we'll have to bring in an architect. We have to make sure the remodeling will include load-bearing walls and such. Why are you trying so hard to sell this? Because this place is titled in your name. Earl left it to you, not us. Anything we do has to be with your written permission. I told them I would think about it. Their disappointment was obvious. I think they expected me to nod and say, Whatever you want, dear. Two weeks later, they presented me with their plans. With a little remodeling and perhaps some expansion, they could make it a very nice place for weddings, reunions, and the like. There will still be a small bar, but on the advice of the insurance agent, only so that guests will have somewhere to stock up on alcohol. That way, if someone has an accident 
or kill someone after they leave the venue, the liability will be on the event organizers, not us. In order to bring in alcohol, they would need to apply for a party permit from the local ABC office and it would only be valid for the day specified. I had an independent expert that I sometimes used to get a second opinion on some projects I was about to get involved in, and his advice was accurate. He once saved me a lot of money by advising me not to enter into a limited partnership with another builder. When I left, he found another one, quickly took the money and ran away. His partner lost almost a million dollars. He came back to me a week later with approval. There are plenty of big venues, but there aren't many small ones around here. Basically all you have is the VFW hall, and it's pretty shabby, but it's always crowded because there's no competition. I estimate this place will start turning a profit as soon as it opens. I went home and signed a lease renewable every two years. I charged them $10 a year and 25% of the profits. This percentage was to pay off the cost of remodeling the premises. At my insistence, they formed a partnership and my involvement, except as a landlord, was minor. It was their brainchild. The remodeling and landscaping took almost seven months. Since the house was in my name, I paid the bills through a separate company set up by my accountant and lawyer. I ended up putting almost half a million into it. This left our cash reserves at their lowest level in a long time, but we were still making good money, so I wasn't too worried. The building looked great. The fire safety capacity was 240 people. The crew built modular structures, such as a bandstand that could be easily dismantled and stored in a back building, and tables and chairs needed for the big event when not in use. There were hardwood floors, beautiful chandeliers, and even a fireplace. The bathrooms were state-of-the-art and looked very elegant. The bar was small and understated, but large enough for the largest crowd. The outside area was landscaped, gazebos and picnic tables were arranged to complement each other, and a playground was set up for the kids in the crowd. All of this was enclosed by a privacy fence. The last thing we wanted was for any child to hurt themselves on our equipment when no one was around. They found the original store sign in the barn that belonged to Earl's uncle and restored it. They installed it above the entrance under a spotlight. Abernathy's Mercantile and Farm Supplies, in three-foot letters. They took it to name the establishment in Earl's honor. Our first event was free of charge. Annette's youngest daughter was getting married. Her finances were tight, and she refused Jason's help, even though he offered. Eventually, daughter Bethany pulled herself together. You have to let him help, Mom. Let him participate in this day. I've already asked him to walk me down the aisle, and he'll be in all the family photos. Get over your anger at my donor and let him in. Jason offered to pay us, but we declined. Let's consider this a dress rehearsal for future events. This girl is practically a niece to us and a daughter to you. Think of it as a family deal. The hall was almost completely filled. Flowers decorated the hall, the lights were dimmed, and the excellent sound system worked flawlessly. Bonnie held one of my hands, and Jules held the other as we watched the service. I felt a warm and fuzzy glow, remembering my own wedding. Then I looked at Jules and saw tears in her eyes. I knew she was thinking about both of her failed marriages. I squeezed her hand a little tighter, and she smiled weakly at me. As soon as the service was over, people came running into the hall and began moving chairs out of their seats and arranging them around small tables set up around the edges of the dance floor. A small orchestra took the place of the gazebo. In the middle of the second number, Jason stepped to the microphone with an acoustic guitar. He played a song he had written for Bethany called simply, Daughter. By the time the last chord subsided, there wasn't a dry eye in the audience. After that day, whenever anyone saw her wedding pictures, she would point to a picture of Annette and Jason, saying that was her mom and dad. The service was filmed by just about anyone with a cell phone, and the song went viral in a matter of days. Four or five agents contacted him, demanding he sell the song or let them place it with one of their artists. Instead, he gave it away for free to a local singer who was making a name for himself in country music. He engineered and produced the song, which led to him producing the entire album. It included two other songs that he co-wrote with the singer. The song Daughter reached number three on the country music charts and number six on the pop music charts. Two other songs reached the top 10 on the country music charts. Suddenly, he became very much in demand and retired. 
He told Annette that if she didn't have his ring on her finger in three months, he would ask her to move out. That was the ring she needed, and we had another wedding for free. The popularity of the song brought an unexpected benefit. People saw what a good venue we had, and soon we had reservations all booked up for months in advance. We hosted many weddings, family reunions that were held mostly on the picnic area, and often included full meals, corporate retreats, and private parties. It was the place for reunions. In fact, we held our 25th reunion there. It was nice to see old friends, some of whom we hadn't seen in years. Jason was there with Annette, Will came with wife number four, and stayed as far away from Annette as he could. Booger showed up as well as Gordy and her husband. We all sort of promised to see each other more often, but I knew it was mostly nostalgia and alcohol. The old crowd couldn't be happy with how the place had changed. Will grinned, looking at the dance floor. Seems like it was yesterday when we were all in here sliding around on the oiled floor. I grinned back. I have a hard time not picturing it every time I'm here. Wild times, huh? Yeah. I wonder what it would be like now. Bonnie and Jules look even better now than they did in high school. And Annette is still a vixen. I don't usually tell people this, but Grace and I lead a pretty free-spirited lifestyle. It would be nice to take a trip down memory lane. I laughed and said I would tell the girls about it. I thought it would be as funny to them as it was to me. I didn't realize that Bonnie had come up behind me, and that conversation had changed the course of our marriage. Dear viewers, what an unexpected turn of events, isn't it? The shack, once just an old rundown place, has turned into a thriving event venue, thanks to the creative minds of Bonnie and Jules. But as we know, life is full of surprises and it seems that our protagonist will face a new challenge in his long-term marriage. Remember, the full story and exclusive research is available on our Patreon page. The dynamic between Bonnie, Jules has changed, and suddenly the idea of polygamy is introduced. This decision seems to have taken him by surprise, and the gravity of such a proposal hangs in the air. What will our hero choose? Will he embrace this unconventional lifestyle? Or will he resist the changes that are looming? The emotions are palpable and the atmosphere is filled with uncertainty. As a cradle of care is created for a new family member, the question remains. Will the foundations of this family be strong enough to withstand the storm of unexpected desires and choices? My friends, stay tuned for the next chapter of this fascinating story. What lies ahead for our characters? What secrets will be revealed? And how will these newly discovered revelations affect their fates? Until next time, remember to feed your imagination and let the journey continue.